Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to uh, Carbide Office Hours number 11. Uh, thanks for joining in and uh, hope you all are doing well. Uh, today, uh, let me know first of all if my audio sounds okay. I kept the same setting from last time. Hopefully it's all right. If it's too loud, too soft, let me know. Um, hopefully we don't have too many distractions in the background. Uh, but on the agenda for today, uh, we're going to cover what's new in MeshCam version 8 and just walk you through how to make tool pads in that. It's a super useful tool for making uh, tool pads from STL files or other mesh models. Uh, you can also bring in DXFs and uh, grayscale height maps just like in Carbide Create Pro. And then we're going to go over uh, a new accessory for the Shape Oco. Uh, and then at the end we'll have an open Q&A session, so if you have um, any questions you want to ask, um, unless they pertain to what I'm talking about right now, try and save them for the end just because there's um, it's hard for me to scroll back up to see what questions I missed. Um, we'll also have someone in the comments just running through, catching comments that I do miss and throwing them in at the end. So, uh, without further ado, um, let's get started. I'm going to cut my face out of the window because no one wants to see that. And then let's go into um, mesh cam. So, uh, do a quick transition and take off the webcam. Cool. All right. Uh, let's open up MeshCam. So if you've used MeshCam in the past before, you'll probably be familiar with a uh, very icon-based um, interface. In fact, I think the um, the old the the website still has some uh, of the old legacy images uh, on there, but it used to be like this, uh, very user UI uh, graphically icon based. Um, and that was great. I actually quite liked it, but at a glance, it really doesn't tell you what your workflow should be. You could sort of step through the buttons here. Um, the new interface um, is a lot more streamlined. So I'm going to go through the process of importing an STL file and showing you how you can make tool pads with it, what all the options do, and then uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. So, to start off, um, I will hit load or file open, uh, and then I will pick an STL model. Uh, so when you bring this in, you have a couple options. Oh, did my Mac freeze? Um, uh, you have the setup window, uh, which lets you configure which side do you want to machine this from. I modeled this model with the side I want to machine facing up in the Z positive direction, so I don't really need to change anything. Top is the uh, correct way to go. You also have front, left, whatever, um, but for this model, it's already oriented perfectly. You can select your file units, and if you check your geometry size here, I did model this as 2 by 2 inches, so everything's correct. If not, you can always scale this up and down. Um, to, to different metric units. The reason you're seeing blue here is because if you scale this to millimeters, it actually comes out super small. So it's like microscopic and the, the coordinate system arrows are just dominating the field of view. Um, and then you can also change your project units. So if you like to work in inches, great. If you like to, to work in millimeters, that's also great. These two don't need to be the same. So these are independent units. So I'm gonna keep everything in inches and then this is sort of like the main workspace, and it's roughly oriented, um, organized, um, sort of as you would do a workflow uh, for CNC tool padding. Um, so you can pick a material, uh, you can set your stock size, uh, which is super important because very rarely is your stock exactly the same size as your model. So let's pretend this is three by three inches. Um, and then if you want to uh, say, hey, three by three inches is exactly how big this is. Don't adjust anything. You can hit fixed stock size. Otherwise, when you change the margins, the stock will uh, dynamically adjust. So if I don't check that and I say I want one inch on the left and two inches on the right, uh, as I go through this, you can see the stock size values automatically updating. So to lock everything down, if you know what size stock you're using, uh, just type it in, hit the checkbox for fixed stock size and then go from there. Um, if you're not machining something in a flip jig, I highly recommend setting your bottom margin to zero. So if I say my quarter inch 
high or tall model is being cut from half inch thick stock. Um, there will be a little top margin and bottom margin by default because it centers itself. So I want zero margin on the bottom, hit OK. And then now the model should be uh, level with the bit. Let me bring up my chat again just to make sure I am not missing anything. So I'm going to minimize that, keep the chat open here. Um, all right, so this is stock prepared around our model. So now MeshCam will know where it needs to machine in order to remove material to liberate the final model that we're going to cut. Um, next up is program zero. So uh, the third item in the sidebar, you can also go to job setup and set program zero. And here, the first thing you'll want to do is figure out, do you want to zero on the top of the model, the middle of the model, or the bottom? Uh, top is good for if you're doing engravings or something where all the features need to be uh, relative to the top surface. I like using the bottom of the stock just because it guarantees that there will be no toolpath that goes deeper than that. So uh, I can keep my wasteboard pristine, assuming I don't crash something into it, which still happens all the time. And then middle of the stock is good if you're using something like a flip jig. Um, that way you can just find the, the middle point of that flip jig and then your zero basically remains unchanged no matter how you move it. So I'll set uh, Z at the bottom of my stock and then you can pick the different corners uh, for your origin to be. You get a full choice, nine different discrete locations. Uh, center would be good if you like, um, uh, if you have like round stock or something if you, maybe if you have a rectangular piece of stock, you draw a cross hatch through it and you find the center. Uh, if you're using the touch probe, most likely the lower left corner uh, will be what you need. So we'll hit OK there. And you can see the coordinate system arrow drop to the bottom left corner. So the zero point is set correctly. Um, max depth uh, determines how deep uh, total uh, you allow this toolpath to go. So again, if you're using a flip jig, you might only need to cut halfway through because you'll approach it from the other side uh, once you flip it over. Here, I will say, yeah, you can go all the way to the bottom of the model or whatever, uh, doesn't really matter. So uh, that is uh, the max depth. Uh, let me pull up, let's see what else is on the agenda. So importing, setting stock size, setting zero. Oh, um, creating a tool. So your tool library in MeshCam is under job setup, list tools. Um, by default, there's only like a couple eighth inch end mills loaded up. This uh, default set that corresponds to the Carbide 3D tool library, um, you can add it by going to help and then add default tools. And that'll load up the, uh, the default end mills. So you have a couple more options to play around with. Um, to create a tool, um, you would go to add. And the first thing you want to do is pick the type of end mill. So as you'll see, we have regular uh, flat end mill. Someone is using compressed air and is super noisy right now, or just dropped something. Um, a ball end mill, and you'll be pleased to know that we added support for tapered end mills and tapered ball mills. So you can go through all these, oh my goodness, uh, different options, and then change the shaft diameter, flute diameter, the taper angle, um, number of flutes, uh, so that should cover a lot of you who like to do um, by other end mills beyond the limited set that we offer. There is also an option for automatic speeds and feeds, and this uses a uh, formula um, to sort of automatically generate them. So in theory, they are optimal. Uh, in practice, you may want to set your own on a per tool basis. Uh, so the choice is yours. You can uh, choose to use automatic speeds and feeds or not. Um, but that is the tool library. So hopefully you guys appreciate the tapered end mill selection. I know that has been a frequent uh, request in the forums. And uh, if that goes well, uh, hopefully we can bring this same tool pathing interface to Carbide Create. So uh, I'm going to cancel this because I didn't input usable values for everything. Um, and we will go on from there. So, how's the chat look in? Um, MeshCam is not only for Nomad. MeshCam is a standalone application. Just like Carbide Create, you can use it with basically 
any machine that uh, takes standard G-code. Um, Meshcam is, uh, as Joshua mentioned, included with a Nomad, uh, but you can buy a standalone license if you don't have a Nomad. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, so in the job setup uh, menu, you can pick your machine type. This uh, doesn't do a whole lot. It changes the formula sort of for the automatic speeds and feeds. So the shape Oko would be a little faster than the Nomad. In theory, we can make it work with uh, many, many other machines. These are just some of the ones that we've played around with before. We don't have the formulas dialed in for a Haas, um, but uh, for Nomad, for Shape Oko, it'll be totally fine. Uh, let's, what else do we have? Um, creating tool, global toolpath options. So uh, this was a feature in the previous versions of MeshCam, but you can select machining regions. So you can say, hey, I want to specifically machine uh, this center region, and maybe I want to avoid this hole. I just don't want to cut into that area. So you can define machining and keep out regions. Um, you can define retract heights. Uh, so when you reposition your tool for a new cut, uh, how far do you retract above the stock material? You really don't need a lot, really just enough to clear any clamps or any unevenness in the material, plus just you know a little safety margin. You don't want to be skimming at exactly zero millimeters above the surface because you'll probably leave a little line going across the top of your part. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's done that before. Uh, let's see, what other global toolpath options do we have? Supports. So um, MeshCam makes oval shaped supports, so they're not rectangular. So when you define the height and the width of them, uh, keep in mind it's going to look sort of like an ellipse. I'll uh, just make one that's maybe 0.1 inches tall and 0.25 inches wide to show you. Um, unless you're using a flip jig, you'll probably want to make your supports at the bottom. And you just click around the perimeter and uh, you can create some supports to hold your model in place. So you can see the oval profile. In reality, because of the uh, undercut here, you'll just sort of have like a, a little domed shape with straight walls. Um, but those define the uh, the supports that the toolpather uh, will respect. Uh, let me delete these machine regions. I apologize, this is an active shop environment, so of course there are some noises in the background. Um, okay, so uh, let's let me see, make sure there's nothing else I need to talk about. Yeah, let's go uh, make some toolpaths. So, the tool pathing in MeshCam is very similar to Carbide Create Pro, in which you start with roughing, you end with a finishing toolpath. There are just a couple additional options that you can use here that you don't necessarily get in Carbide Create Pro. So, um, to start with, you'd probably want to use a roughing toolpath. So you can pick an end mill. Uh, I'm going to say a quarter inch flat end mill. Automatic speeds and feeds are in effect. Um, you can deselect them if possible. Um, my coworkers are being obnoxious. And uh, right now I'm using automatic speeds and feeds. So if I go in here and I hit edit, uh, it's got automatic speeds and feeds selected. If I wanted to change them, I could change them here, but that'd be sort of global. I can change them on a uh, per toolpath basis just by overriding them. Uh, so maybe my plunge feed rate would be 20, I don't know. Uh, step over, 50% uh, um, is pretty typical. And then you have stock to leave options here. So you're not going to use your roughing and mill to go right up to the surface of the part. You're going to leave a little bit of margin so that a gentler, more precise finishing toolpath can uh, be the final uh, thing to surface or cut your material. Um, you have different styles of toolpaths, um, 2D or 3D. So I'm going to show you Let's just generate a 3D toolpath and I can show you what that looks like. Right, chat is uh, still alive, that's good. So in a 3D toolpath, it's gonna just go back and forth and uh, uh, rough out material. But for certain areas around the geometry, you can see there are some diagonal lines here. So even as it goes back and forth and rasters and clears out material, as it approaches uh, sloped or contoured areas, it will um, automatically move in a diagonal direction to avoid them. 
uh, in a, please hold, uh, we are going to shut her off. Um, and then, uh, so in a 2D toolpath, this would not happen. So a 2D strategy, we'll switch it there. Uh, calculate a toolpath. Um, and you can see there is no diagonal line. So every toolpath steps down to its final uh, depth of cut uh, before moving purely in X or Y to rough things out. Um, there are other options. Um, right now, it's using a sort of a parallel raster style toolpath. You can do a contour offset uh, roughing. And so that, instead of having lines going purely back and forth, will look uh, more like sort of like the pocketing toolpaths you're used to. Um, so those are two different options in roughing. You've got 2D, 3D, you've got contour, you've got parallel and you have control over climb or conventional. Um, generally for roughing, I like to just always, always use climb. For finishing, there are some areas like in plastics or certain species of wood where conventional really shines. Um, but we'll just leave that there for now because uh, this is just an example. Uh, we can then apply a finishing toolpath and there are multiple strategies to do this. Uh, parallel finishing is probably the most popular um, and that one, you just, you take a ball end mill, you go back and forth, rastering over stuff. Um, you can pick a step over percentage. Uh, you can pick a direction. Um, and you can also set a threshold angle. So maybe you want this to stop at 60 degrees and to not have the toolpath just drape over a vertical cliff. Um, so you can do that if you want. And that will look like, let me deselect the roughing operation like this. Um, pretty fam uh, standard, I'm sure you're all familiar with a toolpath that looks like this. Um, all right. And then you can also create a waterline finishing. So this is sort of like a 3D contour if you're familiar with that in Fusion. It just basically steps down and traces around a part. Let's calculate that just so I can show you guys. Um, so this is only touching basically the vertical areas or uh, with slopes at or above 45 degrees. And it is respecting the tabs. And then there is also the pencil finishing. So this just looks for corners or the bottom edges of your part. Uh, I guess I need to select a tool for this. Kind of an important step. We will calculate that. And so you can see the toolpath here is just tracing only around everything and it is respecting the tabs again. So that is roughing and finishing in a nutshell. Um, there is one more uh, toolpath that I think is a great addition because it was sorely missed in uh, version six is the cutout toolpath. So this works just like your 2D contour or your plane contour in Carbide Create where it will trace around the outline of a part. Um, so, uh, and there is also ramping enabled if you so choose to do that, which is super useful in something like aluminum. Uh, so we'll calculate that out and you'll see that it's just basically a 2D projection of the part and uh, makes toolpaths around that. I just have a bunch of different uh, hole diameters here so you can see at which point a uh, like an eighth inch end mill will stop fitting in these. Um, and also because if you have it set up, you can also do drilling operations here. So if you see under tool pads, there is a drilling feature. So this just basically does automatic hole detection um, and it figures out where, they're, where the holes are. Um, certain circular features like these chamfers are also picked up so I can deselect those and then hit OK. And then it'll tell you uh, what diameter drills you need, uh, what they're, you can input a tool number for each one. And uh, ideally you wouldn't have so many different size holes in a part, but this is one way that you can do it. Um, so that is just a little extra something that's appreciated that's a tool path thrown into mesh. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let me, let me see what I missed. Uh, 
Okay. Well, who knows, Kyle? Maybe you will one day use MeshCam. Um, I, I would say don't discount it. For people who are doing solid 3D modeling, who maybe come from like a, a Maya background or a 3ds Max or Blender, this can be a really useful way to go from model to toolpath um, without the extra burden of using a parametric software. Um, especially for organic 3D shapes, uh, just throw a chunk of wood in or a wrench shape into a flip jig and uh, yeah, and then uh, you can basically machine it out with a very straightforward set of toolpaths. Okay, um, let me see if there's anything else about MeshCam I want to talk about. Uh, so the answer is no. So I think we're at the point where we can talk about the new accessory. What is that horrendous noise? We're on a very busy street, so I apologize for the racket. Uh, let's talk about the new accessory for the Shape Oak. Uh, let me switch to camera view. Um, cool, I think we're, we're live on the camera. So the, the new accessory that we're adding to the Shape Oko is called the Bit Runner. Uh, so it is uh, an automation aid for your machine. It basically is a giant relay that will turn a router or dust collection on and off. Um, and it is super beefy. Um, the relay will handle literally anything you can throw at a household 20 amp circuit and even a little bit more. Uh, we've tested it to six digits of actuation and then, oh gosh, this is, this is becoming an event. Now I have to clean that up and it's all over my lap. Oh God, there's another one. So yes, uh, we take our product launches very seriously. Um, so BitRunner is a relay that turns the router on and off or any uh, thing that you can plug into it. So it plugs into the wall here, plugs into your, your accessories plug in here. This connects it to your control board. So, um, can't believe they did that to me. Um, and if you've, oh God. <laughs> um, so if you've noticed in the, the recent Shape Ocos, uh, there are like on the double XL, there's a set of holes here for your you know, carbide motion controller. There's also two sets of holes here on any Z plus equipped machines that you might be wondering what, do you, what you would use them for. They are for mounting the bit runner. So there's two holes here. Uh, flip it over, that you would use to screw this into your y-axis rails. You could also use uh, VHB tape to secure this. Um, and the reason you want to keep this on the front of your rail is because there's an on-off switch here. Let me try and zoom in here. Uh, so you've got three modes, on, off, and auto. And so these modes control uh, basically whether or not you're delivering power all the time, uh, you're not delivering power, or uh, power delivery is controlled by G-code. So if you have an M3 uh, spindle command, uh, that will trigger this to turn on and off. Let me refocus the camera. Close enough. Okay. So this is a six pin connector. One end plugs into here, one end plugs into the control board. Um, all the, new all the new control boards, let me zoom in on this again, would normally have a six pin connector in this position, but all the older boards lack this connector. Um, so if you are missing this connector, it would be on any uh, late 2019 or earlier boards of the 2.0 uh, to 2.4 series. Uh, you have two options if you want to use a bit runner. Um, you can either solder in your own connector. We will ship a kit with the bit runner plus connector plus a new enclosure to hold this um, because uh, you need a hole for that port. I think I have an example. So we have a, a new enclosure design um, for the uh, bit runner capable uh, boards. Um, so you have a hole here. Your standard USB power seal there. So we would send you a new enclosure cover 
so that you could install it um, in there. Or we can just send you a whole new board, which is the more expensive option, but if you're not comfortable soldering, uh, you, you shouldn't try to take this on because you could really do some damage. So, um, assuming you have a controller that's capable or you uh, make the necessary arrangements to have a compatible control board, you would plug cable, one end goes to here, one end goes to here, and then let me clear this just because that's going to be a liability later. Um, you can either choose to pass power through to the router all the time, uh, or leave it on auto. So I will show you what the sort of the nominal workflow for the bit runner is. Let me zoom out so you can see that. Wrong way. And focus. Let me check the chat first. Um, okay. Um, yeah, 30 amp relay. Um, and yes, it is kind of a glitter party here. I will have to probably clean that up later. Uh, so, um, let's go through the nominal sort of use case for the bit runner. Uh, let me switch to main screen plus camera view. Cool. Um, all right, so first thing you do when you have a bit runner connected is you go into your settings. Um, there is a feature here in the latest build of Carbide Motion to enable automatic spindle control. If you have a VFD, you might also want to use this, but this primarily is here for BitRunner users. Um, and so this changes up the workflow in a couple of different ways. Um, normally when you're operating a CNC, there's a lot of points at which the machine will just sort of pause and stop and prompt you to do something. Um, and the, um, and uh, <laughs> she completely threw me off. Um, where the machine will pause, stop, and prompt you to hit resume after you uh, change a tool or adjust the spindle RPM. So here, the new workflow, a lot of the points where uh, you no longer need user input are removed. So let me just start a really simple example program. It's going to, it's programmed in as, uh, here, let me actually pull it up in Carbide Create if I still have it open. So I've got two tool paths that need to run with different tools. One traces the inside of this uh, uh, polygonal shape, and one traces right on top of it. So normally you would run the first one, it would stop, it would prompt you to change a tool, it would zero off on the bit setter, <coughs> and then uh, come back to the middle, to prompt you to turn on the router. So here, let's just start this and run through it. So first things first, machine's going to come forward, prompt you to uh, make sure the correct tool is loaded up. <coughs> I'll say, yes it is, do all the tool change stuff, and then at this point, you can arm the uh, bit runner. So you can set the bit runner to auto, you can turn on the router, and then you can resume. It's gonna do its thing, and once it comes back, it's not gonna stop and ask you to turn on the router, because it can do that itself. So it'll move back and do its thing, which we will see now. It's gonna blow away all the glitter, not enough of it. <clears throat> and it'll automatically retract and turn off the red. It'll come forward and we do need to stress that the, the best safety practice is to turn off the router before you touch it. Just We've tested this, it's pretty reliable, but just in case, just like, liability reasons, you know, like make sure you turn it off, do your tool change stuff, rearm the system by turning the router back on, and hit resume. It'll go off, it'll do its next uh, tool change, uh, I mean the tool probe, and it'll come back and <coughs> do its thing. Um, so because there is no data cable going into here to control the speed, the RPM is something you need to set. Um, I'll wait for this to stop. When it's done, just throw everything back into the off position just to be safe. Um, 
the RPM is not controlled by the bit runner. However, uh, it's usually determined on a per tool basis. Um, if you go back to the speeds and feeds episode we did, uh, what, sh what you most care about in an end mill, in a cutter, is the surface speed. So the, the speed of that cutting edge uh, relative to the material that you're cutting into. And for any given tool in any given material, there's pretty much one sweet spot. So for this tool, you shouldn't be doing like a pocketing at 18,000 RPM and then a contour tool path at 16,000 RPM. For the most part, it should be the same RPM. So when you load a tool, turn the dial to the necessary setting and you should be go, uh, good to go until the next tool change. Um, if there is a communication fault, it should uh, default to shutting it off. Um, it's reading a signal from the board to enable. So if that signal is not present, the router should be turned off. Um, just like if you unplug the bit runner, it defaults into the off state. Um, also, if you're running a toolpath um, and you hit pause in the middle of it, that will also uh, retract the spindle and also shut it off. Uh, so that just gives you one more option if something goes horrifically wrong here, and uh, I've had this happen before, but just something gets stuck on this and it's flailing around, you don't need to get close to the router to turn it off. You either have a switch here or you can do it in the software to turn off the spindle. So uh, BitRunner is probably going to launch officially next week, but at this very moment, assuming my, uh, my collaborator um, is hearing this and not mocking me, um, it will be on sale right now, and we will run a special discounted price for the next hour for all of you guys, just to thank you guys for tuning in and uh, making these live streams a success. Uh, so for the next hour, uh, BitRunner will be discounted. We will throw a link up in the chat um, to the page as soon as it is up. And uh, yeah, that is BitRunner in a nutshell. Uh, so let's see, mechanical installation, electrical installation, software changes. Um, so at this point, I want to open it up to you guys. Do you have any questions uh, about using a CNC, about the bit runner, about mesh cam, or just uh, CAD cam CNC stuff in general? Um, you can plug a surge protector into the end. So this thing, as we said before, is rated for uh, 30 amps. Uh, but most household circuits will top off at uh, 20. Um, and uh, so basically anything you can fit in there will uh, work. Um, so if you want to throw dust collection on there, I know that's been a recurring question. Well, like, what do you use for dust collection? Uh, if it's a shop vac, if it's a dust collector, if it runs off 120, you can throw it on here and just automate its actuation. Um, so, let's see. For a vacuum or mister, uh, yeah, you could basically throw any electrical accessory onto here. Uh, for the most part, router is an easy one just because that is the most common one, and it should also stop people, because we we've heard the horror stories of people accidentally leaving their router on while it does the tool touch off, so hopefully this will help eliminate it. Um, let's see. Uh, do I own Carbide? No, I don't own Carbide. I just work for them. I make videos for them. Um, honestly, I, I don't want all the responsibility of owning a manufacturing company. Um, so I am happy to just keep making videos. Um, can an e-stop be installed alongside it? Uh, I believe so. So on the control board, there is a pair of pins for feed hold. And so that basically just acts like a pause button. So I believe in Gerbil, when that's triggered, it'll act just like pause. It should do the retract spindle and turn it off. Um, does MeshCam 8 still allow import of images like MeshCam Art? I can't say I've used MeshCam Art before, but if you go into the um, uh, dialogue for opening up images in uh, MeshCam 8. Let me see if I have a usable JPEG out here. 
Uh, if you open an image, I'm just going to use my own logo because it's more or less black and white. Um, it should be able to import in a bitmap, JPEG, PNG, whatever, and develop a height map from that. And then uh, you should be able to machine that. Again, just very similar to Carbide Create Pro. Um, oops. Uh, let's see. What's to stop from connecting a relay or contact to the board instead of buying the Carbide option? Uh, Honestly, if you want to take the liability and go through the effort to develop that, you can. This is just something we are offering as a product. Um, this should be compatible with 240 volts. Um, you should be able to double check that on the product page. Uh, why a limited run? Uh, we'll see as this uh, continues, just how it goes. Um, if you guys like it, we'll keep making it. But again, we are constantly evaluating our options. Uh, how much is the special price right now? Um, you can click the link. Uh, let me see if I can fire it up here. Um, go into the shop page, 4-bit runner. So that is the uh, current sale price. Um, so after this, it should be, I think, $100. Uh, so uh, yeah, that is BitRunner in a nutshell. Um, cross document, copy and paste. You know, I like that idea. Um, we are, we do our product development in uh, cycles. Uh, so this, the past couple weeks have been mesh cam. Uh, if you leave us your comments in the forums or like, uh, well actually just in the forums, uh, and it gains traction if people make it clear that that's a feature they want, we will do it. Uh, it's just that we have limited resources, so we need to prioritize them for some of the uh, the more pressing problems or bugs um, that come up. Uh, but again, open a dialogue with us. We are open to considering it. Um, let's see. So, um, unless there are any other specific questions, um, I think that pretty much covers it for this live stream. Um, specifically regarding Sweepy, when will it be in stock? We, it's hard for us to promise a date because right now we are entirely supplier limited. So we don't want to make you a promise and then have that supplier break the, their promise to us and it makes us look bad. Um, I can say hopefully uh, around mid-June. Um, future plans, I could tell you, but then I would have to kill you. Um, and then, yeah. Well, um, I will keep the stream running for a couple minutes just so that YouTube doesn't shut it down, but I will be in the chat if you've got any last minute questions. Um, and it is not my birthday, I wish it was. It's just that my coworkers decided to celebrate this launch in a very colorful, glittery manner. So I wish you all uh, uh, good luck and enjoy your, your machining. Stay safe and uh, we'll be back next week. Take care guys. Let's go to the